All right, so this is Sometimes Record, episode number 24, being recorded on May 14, 2020. I think I got that right. Got with me two very special guests, one of them a new member to the website. We'll be talking to him in a moment. And then also a returning appearance here at uh, Sometimes Record, AP, coming to us from... Are you still in Singapore, AP? Still in Singapore, JLB, and the flights are getting pushed back further and further. So um, I actually don't know how long more I'm going to be here, but it, but it looks at things. So were you already meant to have flown back to Australia by now? Yeah, so the first flight back was on the 22nd of May. That got pushed back then until the 2nd of June was the first day you were able to book a flight. So now all of June is scratched off their calendar, and the next flight out of here is the 1st of July. Oh, I see. So you're expecting to fly in a week's time, then that got delayed, and now it's being delayed again. So basically, you're in Singapore indefinitely, is what you're telling me. Yeah, but but by the looks of it, my only option would be to fly to a southern state. I think I mentioned the last time, and I'd have to quarantine uh, for 14 days in a hotel room with my wife and daughter and then we'd have to cross the border and go into the NT a different state and and quarantine again in a hotel room for another 14 days so Singapore is <laughs> wow that's messed up man you've got my sympathy here in beautiful Kuala Lumpur Malaysia you know they extended our lockdown another month another month they extended it so they were doing two weeks they did two weeks then two weeks then two weeks I think there was four two weeks is all up and then a few days ago, they're like, you know what? Let's just make it a month. Let's just make it another month. But what that means for me is I get to stay here indefinitely. And even if they, even if they wanted to like boot us out, there's no plans to take us anywhere. So we're basically on ice here. I, I, recall, I recall you saying that. And I thought that seemed a bit counterintuitive because you, you uh, gave that information a couple of days after you were going back into the coffee shops and things were starting to open up again. So why, why would the the coffee shops and the supermarkets and shopping centers begin to open back up and then they extend the lockdown. That seems a little bit bipolar, if you ask me. Excellent question. It's kind of like two steps forward, one step back kind of thing. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, oh, we'll open up the cafes. We'll open up the shopping malls. However, we're going to extend, not by two weeks this time, but by a month now, the moving control order. Mm. And they had a very cheeky little tactic. They then changed the name from movement control order to uh, CMCO. What is it? Something movement control order. The C stands for something, but it's like, it's still a lockdown, but it's a special kind yeah. of lockdown. We're allowed to go to cafes. Oh, and by the way, no one can come here for a month. Because remember, there's people who are locked out of the country who can't come back. Like there are expats who have wives and families and stuff here. And I guess, in theory, husbands too, but generally it's wives and hus- uh, wives. Let me try and yeah. uh, not mix. You know what I'm trying to say here. It's usually dudes, right? And they're the stuck out of the in. country. Yeah, it's the blokes. And they're stuck out of the country, can't come back. So to all the people who are depending on their family members to come back, it's like, well, you can go to cafes, guys, and you can go to shopping malls, and we're going to add a little C to the front of the MCO, but the people who are out of the country can't, can't come back for at least another four weeks. Two steps forward, one step back. The, these lockdowns are going to be um, not going anywhere soon. And I'll... Give you what, I'll, give you, I'll give you a quick example as to why I think that is. I was in the supermarket yesterday, and as I told you before, you have to scan your ID going into the supermarket, get your temperature checked, and, and then head on up. In, uh, you have to do it going into the shopping center, and then do it going into the supermarket, and then do it when you're leaving again. And as I'm leaving, everyone's there dropping their, their plastic bags on the floor, taking their IDs out, scanning their IDs, and there's a big backlog, bottleneck, trying to get out of the, the, the place. And it just dawned on me, they're going to wave this chip in people's faces now and say, listen, you don't have to get your ID out of your wallet anymore. Just scan your hand and you can leave. It's going to be so convenient. Uh, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm waiting on you yeah, now. I saw that comment from you. I saw that comment from you about people now having to use their IDs to get into shopping centers. So in, what you're saying is in Singapore, you've actually got to provide your identification to get into a shopping center. That's what you're saying. Yeah, so everybody here has what's called an IC, and I have a version of it, but it's a green one because I'm, I'm not a resident. I just have a five-year visa, and that has a barcode on the back, which you scan. So it basically saves them not having to carry their passport around, but it's just as valuable as a passport. Um, and that has a barcode which gets scanned every time you enter into the shopping center and when you enter into a big supermarket. So you scan it twice going into the actual supermarket. 
But it wasn't like that before coronavirus, right? Or has it been like that for a while? Did you have to have a... No, that, ID- that was... That everyone had an IC, but they carried it on them. But the scanning of them going into buildings, now that's only a, a COVID-1984 uh, measure. Yeah, I see. I see. Did you see my video that I released yesterday where now to go into shopping centers here, not all of them, but at least one of the ones that I went to, they've now got the facial recognition. So they've got the green boxes on people's heads, like the virtual green box on people's heads as they walk into shopping centers. What country is that? I'm in Malaysia, man. So I, I made a video last night. No, I called oh, it Dance Monkey. It's only released it a few hours ago, really. So I don't blame yeah. anyone who, have, who haven't had a chance to see it yet. But I showed footage. I took footage of it. I recorded it. I'm like, if you record me, I'll record you. So I recorded them recording me. And as you're walking, this is just a shopping center, okay? I'm not going to a, some, um, I'm not going to meet the king or the queen, okay? It's a shopping center, for Christ's sakes. Yep. And he had to queue up to get in, and they're showing this big screen in front of you that there's like this green virtual box. It's facial recognition is the point of my story. Let me just cut to the chase here. You think that it's some kind of uh, temperature detection. No, it's not. Well, look, maybe it's that too. I don't know. But what we definitely know is it's facial recognition to get into a, into a shopping center in Malaysia. Oh, shit. That, that's what I was trying to clarify. I didn't know if you had seen a, a video online of somewhere in China. But you, So that, that was actually in Malaysia, which is... Uh, Bro, I, I can tell you right now, I don't know what's happening in China, but it's definitely happening here in Malaysia. I even documented it. And what was funny was it didn't seem to capture my face because I was wearing my Vietnamese hat and a mask, but it was capturing everybody else's faces because no one else was wearing a hat. So we're all queuing up, and I'm like, what the hell is going on here? And then, yeah, I got to the front, and sure enough, it's facial recognition. So, and that's, that's Malaysia, okay? And I know that most of the listeners who are listening don't know much about Malaysia. This, is not some, this country is not some crappy third-world country. Right, it's it's a Shit, developed, no. especially Kuala Lumpur. Kuala Lumpur is a, an advanced, developed city. Okay, it, this is not some bizarre uh, dictatorship. Like, in other words, if it's happening here, in my opinion, it I can think, happen it's only, Well, it's going to happen everywhere, in my opinion. Mm, mm, same, uh, same, as, same as you guys with your barcodes on your ICs. That's today's the first I've heard of that. Literally four minutes ago, when you told me that, that's the first I've heard of mm. barcodes on your IDs. I didn't even know it was a thing. Yeah, yeah, and that's, that's being part of, of what they have here. Um, but it was just the bottlenecks yesterday getting out of the shopping centres. It's just the inconvenience of it. Uh, and I was looking, and I'm like, that's going to be a perfect segue for them to just say, uh, easy access in and out, just swipe your hand and you can uh, get, get your chip scanned in a, a split second. You don't have to drop your bags. You don't have to pick up your wallet and get your ID out. So... And they lap it up here. They will absolutely lap it up. Hold on, the bottle shop. Did you? Did I hear you say a bottle shop? No, no. In as in, they drop drop their bags. They have to drop. Their ah, bags sorry. I thought you said you were going in and out of a bottle shop. Maybe. See, I'm on day sixteen. I think of sobriety. I think it's my sixteenth day today. Sixteen or seventeen. I've lost count. And maybe my brain is just like making a desperate cry for attention. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm here in bottle head shop. Head yeah, <laughs> yeah, someone says all you is bottle shop. <laughs> Hey, you know what we've got to do? We've got to introduce our, uh, our newest guest here at JohnTheBond.com. So without further ado, why don't we say hello to him right now. King Raz coming to us from Estonia. Thank you for waiting patiently there as we uh, warmed up into the call. Welcome to JohnTheBond.com. Say hello to everybody out there in JohnTheBond.com land. Hey, everybody. How's it going? We're terrific. Now, you are coming to us from Estonia. Correct. Well, you've just heard myself and AP talk about what's happening in Asia. Tell us what is happening in Estonia. Are you getting facial recognition? Are you getting barcode scanned IDs? Tell us what's happening in. Is it East? Would you call yourself Eastern Europe? Is that a fair, like North Eastern yeah, Europe? Yeah, yeah. North Eastern Europe. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah, I don't see nothing like that going on in Estonia. It's actually been pretty chill here, you know, uh, compared as to what is happening everywhere else. There seems to be like a common agenda with different parts of the world pushing out different things uh but um yeah in estonia it's been pretty chill like there's not nothing too extreme going on only thing i've seen was uh just me and two guys standing out in front of a house at like 9 a.m in the morning and then just cops pulling up and uh basically disbanding us because you cannot have more than two people grouped grouped up on the street unless you're a family and I even got a when, when all that when that rule like came to be, I got a message from the government on my phone that you cannot group with, you know, two or more people. I mean, you can group up with up to two people 
in public, which was kind of weird. So is that still the rule? Is the rule still that you can't have more than two people together? Or have they started relaxing the uh, restrictions? I'm pretty sure they started relaxing now because uh, starting from next week, I think the schools are reopening. And uh, I heard something that the gyms are opening up again soon. So, yeah, I mean, nothing too extreme here. but Were people thrown out of work? Because you know how in a lot of parts of the world, like uh, businesses were closed down, so... A lot of people became oh, unemployed. Was that something that yeah. happened in, in Estonia as well? Yeah, that definitely happened. It happened to me as well. <laughs> I lost my job, but, you know, I just went on and found another one. Fair enough. Well, you know what we should do? Let's come back and talk about coronavirus later on. I'm sure we've both got, we've all on the call got lots to speak about. But what we need to do is what we usually do with new members here at JohnTheBond.com, which is give you a chance to tell us how did you first find out about this website? How did you first get into alternative information or conspiracy theories, this kind of thing. Just tell us your, your journey to, to this website and to this sort of part of the uh, internet. Whenever we have a new person on the, on the site, we'd love to hear, how did you end up here? Because this place is very different to any other website that's out there, as far as I'm aware. So how do people make their way here? We always love to find out. So you tell us, how did you arrive at johnthebond.com? Yeah, it's interesting. Actually, the same person that got me into the act realm in the first place was the one that got me onto this very website which is, uh, of course, Super Ranger number 33, Hando. And um, basically, it was like five years ago, I think, my big brother showed me um, a video series in Estonian called, like, roughly translates to science fiction, which was about 9-11 and Osama bin Laden and the money system and all type of topics, which were like, you know, your normal conspir- conspiracy conspiratard um, cases, I guess. Um, and that's where my journey began, ultimately, like, in 2015. So, yeah, I was uh, in that, you know, conspiracy hole for years. I started doing my own research, so to speak, because, you know, <laughs> you think that watching videos on YouTube with people just giving you information without any claims is research but it's really not it's just fucking entertainment and mental masturbation uh so i got really lost in that actually for years and i became quite um fearful of just you know even existing and walking about and doing my thing it was crazy it like messed me up mentally in a huge way so far that i actually like lost my mind <laughs> in the streets of Brisbane, fighting cops while under the influence of a big dose of acid. Um, you know, just fully out of it. And I don't even remember what happened that night, you know. But I do remember, like, living through a horror movie. Like, I was actually in a horror movie. And all the, like, conspiratorial thoughts I had in my head actually came to life with the help of acid, of course, but that stuff had been sitting there for years, just building up this um, charge, I guess. And uh, I could not even, yeah, like relax or just be a normal dude in public because I was always looking at those 5G antennas and the chemtrails. And and I even started thinking, the craziest part, I started thinking that they're out to get me, you know? There's someone out there chasing me, trying to get me. And even go, going to Australia the last year, uh, the moment I was beaten down, you know, on asphalt by those cops, I was thinking that, oh, they, they, that was their plan all along. They ju- tried to get me here. It was a setup. Oh, shit. You know, and <laughs> it took me a few weeks to get out of that. I, start, I stopped. I came to a full stop. I tuned out of all the conspiracy shit. And I was like, all right, I'm obviously living in a reality that is like, it's not even real. It's all in my own head. And I could not get rid of these thoughts. Like I was walking down the street, seeing people here and there. And I thought they were all in on it, just like watching me and shit. I went like fully psychotic mental. And uh, what broke the spell for me was just sitting down uh, by myself one day, you know, in that state. And I, and I started asking myself, like, who the fuck do I think I am? That I'm be that this is all done for me. That they went through all this effort to put me in a situation like this. Like, who the fuck do I think I am? So <laughs> that's when I started realizing that it's all a big fucking ego trip. And uh, 
yeah, I guess the road to recovery started from there. And I remember at one point watching a video by Hando. Uh, I think it was about the history hoax and the guy here, Hirat, Hirat, Hiratus. Hard to pronounce that one. But um, I used to mispronounce that one. I used to call him Herodotus. I think I can't even remember how I used to pronounce it, but it did even I mispronounce that one. So yeah. Plus, yeah, he was a fake a... character. How can you mispronounce the name of someone who never existed? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> true, true. Yeah. Uh, basically, he referenced your video. I think he actually had a clip of your video in his, and that's where it first started from. Where I f- that's where I f- first found your channel and uh, started just watching every video, all the things I could get, get, get my hands on. And in 2019, I think I even was a MUC member for like two months. And uh, that must have been with a different username then, because I don't remember King. I mean. Yeah, I, it was a uh, Rasmus, like R A Z M Y S. Yep, yep. Yeah, I remember. Yep. I even sent you a letter, like I have to leave right now because my life situation was so crazy with all the courts and uh, everything going on. So I didn't really have time to do any research or nothing like that. But your stuff definitely helped me, like snap out of that fucking hell I was dragged into, or that I willingly, I I guess, put myself into, because. Um, yeah, I'm not a victim. I do not choose to be a victim, and you you see it everywhere. Just in the, especially in the act realm, people you know choosing to be victims of uh, shit that might not even exist. And most of the stuff is not even backed up by claims. I I cannot even understand. Looking back now, like it's so weird. I was just looking at videos and just sucking it all in because I guess it was feeding my victim mind state so i didn't even bother to do you know the fact check and to actually see if any of that stuff holds merit in real life and uh yeah it's been a bizarre ride to say the least but um i'm back now healthier stronger than ever so thank you for doing the work you do and i'm happy to have ended up in this corner of the internet well, I really appreciate that. Thank you. So basically, it sounds like you've been on quite a wild ride. I'll ask you a few questions about that, and then I'm sure AP will have some questions as well. So first of all, you're in Estonia, which is a lot smaller geographically than Australia. Are you near Tallinn, the capital city, or are you in a different part? Yep, I'm actually in Tallinn as we speak. So have you ever met Hendom in real life? No, I have not. I've only you know seen his video series, or a couple of videos on YouTube. I think he was actually trying to be, become a politician at some point. And I signed that petition too. And uh, I've also heard he's a DJ in some sort of a club, 9-11, I think it's called. And uh, I've never met him in person or went to any, to any of those parties, but I've been aware of his existence. <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. My plan is to come to Estonia eventually. Like We don't know if the, if the flights will ever work the way they used to, but there's no harm in being yeah. optimistic about these things. And if I come to mm-hmm. Estonia and I don't meet Hando, man, there'll be some major problems. And the same now goes for you, King Ray. So hopefully we can organize a get-together. And maybe you haven't yeah. been on the website long enough to see this, but Hando actually documented for us his, um, his time running for parliament. And All right. to cut a really long story short, I was in Chiang Mai, Thailand a few months ago, which is like the, right. the mecca for so-called digital nomads. And I met some mm-hmm. Estonians there, and they knew of Hando. They knew of telegram.ee. <laughs> Because yeah. he's an he's a, he's a ooh he's an anti vaxxer right? So apparently yeah, yeah, yeah. you've got the same pro vaccination propaganda in Estonia as we have in Australia and, and other Western countries. Like you guys have the same, uh, you know, ooh anyone who's anti vax is the devil kind of thing, yeah. Yeah, pretty much demonizing anything that is like anti mainstream. Yeah, what I'll do is for those because there's so many new members on the site, I'll put links to. My, uh, my recollection of meeting those Estonians, I'll never forget that experience. They were such nice people, even after the, the Hando uh, revelation. But you could just see the change in their demeanor once they discovered that I'm, I have similar opinions to Hando. The whole atmosphere changed, right? Because, hey, Hando, is, he's the number one conspiracy guy in Estonia, isn't he? Yeah, true. He's very out there. And uh, a lot of people, yeah... Just think of him as a clown, or at least from what I've heard. Well, these two didn't seem to have uh, much respect for him, but the fact of the matter yeah. is they know of him. Like, he's made an impact. Mm. There's no doubt about that. 
and he had the guts to run for parliament, and he ran for parliament openly stating that 9-11 is a hoax. Yep. <laughs> That's, the amount of courage that that takes is just hard to fathom. So uh, I could sit here and talk about Hando all day, but we need to move on. So you've got Hando, he gets you into looking into this material. This is about 2015, so a lot of the members here are sort of, I think it's coronavirus that's sort of got them into this, to this area. But a lot of people mm-hmm. have been here since 2010, if not sooner. So can I ask you, when did you first start looking at things like 9-11? Like, have you looked at, you know, some people believe that 9-11 was uh, a hoax and never happened. Have you looked at those sorts of topics? Yeah, a little bit. And uh, as I mentioned before, Hando actually, you know, had it in his movie and he deconstructed the 9-11 event pretty in much detail. And um, I don't know if I looked into it after that uh, too much, but um, yeah, I definitely know a little bit about what what went down, possibly. Because, you know, some of us believe that there's a very strong chance that nobody even died. Like the 3,000 yeah. victims, they didn't exist. Uh-huh. The planes that supposedly flew into the buildings, they didn't yeah, exist. Right. Osama bin Laden, the boogeyman, he didn't exist. All of it's just a movie. And I know that's mm-hmm. a very extreme thing for a lot of people to hear, but there's a lot of people on this website, I'm one of them, where we're pretty convinced that is the case. Mm. Did Hando go into detail about that? Because I haven't seen... I can't understand Estonian, so I have no idea what, the, what he's put in his video. Did he explain all of that in his video? Yeah, well, um, as I remember it now, uh, I think he put Osama as a CIA, CIA agent and, you know, that he wasn't a real boogeyman to begin with and that the buildings were detonated on purpose and there were bombs in the structures. And I think later on, he even said that the planes weren't real, that they were just, you know, holographs. And I could see that a little bit on the video where the plane, you know, goes into the building and the front part of the plane comes out the other side, which is, you know, not even possible because the plane is made of aluminium flying into a like a metal structure or a steel, hard core steel structure. It shouldn't even go into the building in the first place yeah, that's that's kind of like why the um the nose out is almost a red herring it's like guys the problem isn't the plane coming out the other side the problem is the plane going into the building in the first place Do you know what I mean? yeah right exactly yeah okay so that's 9-11 so you mentioned brisbane what were you doing so the listeners most of them know that i grew up just outside of melbourne i mean melbourne's a huge city so officially i was like in melbourne but i was a long way from from downtown melbourne but that's if you had to say where did i grow up i'd say melbourne uh, just basically but then I moved to Brisbane back in 2011. So I spent seven, just over seven years in Brisbane. And uh, I look back on that time relatively fondly, I would say. But what brought you to Brisbane? What were you doing there? Well, we got to start with the way I came to Australia in the first place. It was random. <laughs> I mean, I, I always wanted to travel the world and uh, I've done it before. But there was basically, I went to a, a birthday party of a friend and then some guy showed up and, you know, he was cool. He looked like an adventure, and uh, on the second day, he was like, "Hey, Raz, you want to come to Australia with me?" I was like, "Just took a moment." I was like, "Yeah, why not?" And then in four months, we just went to Australia, and it turns out that he already had been there for like two years on his uh, working holiday visas, and he had a whole circle of friends he kind of brought me into, so I didn't have to make you know any new contacts and. Uh, yeah, at first I went down to like New South Wales and near Kyogle doing some farm farm work and going to a few doofs. What is that's what they call parties there, like bush parties. Bush doofs. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, you should explain yeah, it to people. Bu- you want to explain for all the listeners who have no idea what this is, what a bush doof is? Uh, well... A whole bunch of young, funny. cool people doing a whole bunch of drugs and paying no attention yep. to the music. And uh, basically, yeah, just spending two or three days getting high as kites. Is that a fair description? That is a very accurate description, yeah. and there was a lot of that going on. It was. It's fun though. I'm not. I, don't, I hope I'm not coming across as condescending. I mean, it's if people go and do it, it's fun. Like people have a good time. So I'm not. I'm not bagging them. But uh, yeah, the old bush. Stuff. Yeah. Good, good stuff. What uh, What suburb were you in in Brisbane? Out of interest. A uh, suburb. Yeah, I was in uh, West End, the hippie part of town. Wow, dude! I was living in St Lucia, just across the river. And uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. West... That's close. I worked in St Lucia. What at the university? Uh, no, it was um, a current, uh, Hillstone, St. Lucia. It's a, like a big building on top of a 
mountain next to a golf field where you can get a lot of weddings happen there. So I was basically a bartender there for like four months. Ah, I see. Yeah, yeah. So for listeners who have no idea what we're talking about, yeah. So the university, the, the main, the prestigious university is UQ, which is in St. Lucia, which is where I went to university. And if you look at my, um, some of my baller skeptic material, I even recorded a couple of videos at the campus because it's a beautiful campus and I made some videos there. And then West End is just across the river, which used to be the trendy hippie sort of, you know, student area, but it's being very, uh, what's the word, gentrified now. So it's become the upmarket sort of, I don't know how you say it. it's It's almost getting too pricey for students these days. But yeah, once upon a time, it was the, uh, the trendy cool area. And I spent... Uh, well, actually, the story that was told, who told the story when I was chatting with, when I was chatting with Hilly for Member Discord Call Season 214, which I just released a few days ago, he mentioned a story that I told about how some psychiatrist lost his mind in a book reading <laughs> because somebody was <laughs> criticizing psychiatry. That happened in West End. That was where the, uh, the bookstore was that had these uh, book readings. So how about this? So some dude from Estonia has made his way to johnthebond.com. He actually was staying in a suburb just across the river from me. We might have even crossed paths at some point. Crazy stuff. So tell us about, uh, and, and by the way, we'll get to AP. I'm sure he's got some questions for you as well. So tell us about uh, this incident with the, the police and the acid and what have you. Uh, let me say I've been arrested by Queensland police. So I'm not here to judge anybody. And uh, I've also had one or two bad experiences with acid. So a lot of what you're saying is resonating with me. But basically you just, what, you had a bad, a bad trip and you ended up being locked up for the night? What's, what's going on there? All right. Uh, so that experience was pretty crazy uh we have been partying for like a few days i'd say about three days and you know not sleeping much doing a lot of drugs just hanging out and then uh, it was 3 a.m on a sunday we were sitting in front of the house in hillstone which is between saint lucia and west end and um basically we we're just having a good time and so one of my friends was like i wish someone had acid right now and I remembered that I just happened to have this, um, what do you call it? Uh, it's like a little bottle you can uh, drip teardrops out of. And basically you put the liquid form of acid in there. And it was empty. There was nothing in there. It, it had been used up. But the thing with these bottles is you can um, take the bottle, wash it out, and uh, still get a little bit out of that. So I did that. I put it into a small glass, and we sat on a trampoline, passing it around. Uh, I started with a pretty decent sip, and uh, it went around the circle. Uh, other people did not drink it that much, and uh, it came back to me, and I and I asked from the circle, like, does anybody else want some? And nobody wanted anymore, so I just downed it in one gulp, and <laughs> it was an uncertain amount of acid which uh, was interesting. For the first hour, everything seemed pretty okay. And then I started going into this, you know, cartoon reality and everything started getting a bit, a little bit more loopy and exciting, I guess. And then after a while, the the few people that I knew from Brisbane uh, went away. I think they went to sleep in another room or something. And it was just a house I had moved into like one week ago. And um, I started walking around and just, you know, these obsessive, crazy thoughts started entering my head. And I was like, my heart started pounding. I started sweating a bit. And, you know, it just didn't feel right. Something didn't feel right. So uh, suddenly I started, you know, I got into a more, his, uh, how, would, how would I say that? Um, I just got really frightened, and I, I thought I was going to die. And I even remember saying that even death would be better than this. Like, I started hearing my thoughts so loud. It was like the voice in my head was turned up so high. And I just started having these crazy thoughts. And then one of the people told me uh, to maybe take a cold shower to cool down because I looked very sweaty and stuff and kind of you know, out of myself. So I went there, took my clothes off. I put the water on for a second, but I didn't want to jump in. I was—I just smelled the water. I smelled the chemicals in the water. I was like, Bleh, dummy water. <laughs> and I, I, I went back to my room with, you know, just a towel on. I had thrown off all my clothes. And I tried to look around the room, and there was just 
this dark cloud like this dark massive i don't know what you call like energy or just like a dark cloud in my room like it was like swallowing my whole room and i even saw it like climb onto my body and stuff it was it was pretty crazy and all i thought to myself was like i gotta get out of here i gotta run and so i did <laughs> i went out on the street with just a t- towel around my waist and you know uh the moment i went out is the moment it got actually like really crazy uh it was like living in a movie really and uh i start, started at some point walking on the street you know just barefoot 3 a.m on a sunday <laughs> uh with just a towel around my waist walking in the street i started seeing these lizards like tens of thousands of lizards upon upon each other and they they were literally so real that i was like amazed how how i didn't touch them as i stepped along and um yeah at some point it, it, they all seemed friendly and it was fine i was pretty calm at first but at some point when I, like a speck of fear entered my psyche uh, i just triggered i was just going, ah just went mad and started screaming at those lizards in estonia and took off the towel around my waist started like whipping them or something screaming what do you want what do you want from me <laughs> And you can imagine, like, a naked guy <laughs> running up and down the street at 3 a.m. in Brisbane, just screaming on the top of his lungs. Uh, yeah, that will <laughs> get some attention. So um, a couple of people woke up, and they called the police, and there was this one cop. Ah, I, there was something that happened before that. So there's, there was this one guy that walked with me from the house. He walked behind me, but I didn't even see him. And it was the same guy that actually told me to go take a shower (laughs) he came up to my face and he was like raz the cops are coming you gotta get out of here i was like all right i registered him for that very moment and then he walked away because i think the cop car was coming over the hill and uh i was just looking at the street and it was like a kaleidoscope of colors and patterns and shit i couldn't see nothing and i was like where do i go there's nowhere to go (laughs) and um uh, there was one scene I remember before that also, which is kind of cool. Uh, I mean, kind of funny. I was walking down the street asking, does anyone have a gun? Please shoot me in the fucking head. And then I hear this voice. Like, I, I just felt like the whole universe or God or whatever you want to call it. The cosmos just laughed at me. It was like, what are you going to do then? Like, where are you going to go next? just laughing at me i felt so stupid stupid like a little kid that just had his candy snapped from it snapped from him but um yeah so the cops cup comes up and from that moment on i don't remember anything so i have a i have the story of the cop to <laughs> take this further so he approached me from behind and uh i think he told me to sit down and you know calm down because i was like growling and making some weird noises so um basically but, let me so point, i don't mean to interrupt you was this all completely out of character for you like this all of oh, this totally, stuff was totally, man. like there was no this wasn't something that happened before and then it just got worse this was all no, completely no, no, out of character. not a habit <laughs> i i did, did not have the habit of running through the streets like, running from like lizards and shit and you know it was completely out of character man it's nothing like this has ever happened to me before like i've never had a like a psychotic i don't know trip or breakdown or whatever because i was hearing all type of voices and everything so this is like the first time anything like this has has happened to was on this particular evening so now that now that you mention it i actually i remember being uh five years old in the middle of the night like waking up uh, i had a light on like a night light and i i woke up and i saw everything was had trails everything was super like slow-mo and trippy And I heard like a million voices inside my head going like, you know, even voices had trails. And I remember climbing out of my bed and going, (laughs) sitting next to a wall and just falling asleep. And then I woke up in the morning sitting next to a wall. I was like, oh, what happened? So that's the only, you know, experience I can equate to that one. Yeah. So basically this is this particular evening was like the first time you've had like a, whether people want to call it a psychotic episode or whatever it was um it was the first time anything like that's happened to you wow that on a personal level this is very interesting to me for a number of reasons but what we need to do before we go further 
we do need to throw to AP. I'm sure he's got some questions for you. So before we do that, you can you can probably we can probably fill in a lot of the pieces here so the police turn up and they do what they have yeah, to yeah. do. They've got to arrest That's you probably... and, and let you go and what have you. And then uh, did you have to go to yep. court or was it just like they locked you up, they let you go and, and that was they gave you a fine oh, no. probably and that was the end of the well, I was in the hospital for 48 hours, and then I was in the, you know, the cop station overnight for like 12 hours, and uh, then they let me out on parole, pretty much, and I had to report to the cop station daily for about seven months. Uh, that's how long the court pro- process took, and uh, then I basically got out with uh, uh, suspended imprisonment for one year, with a parole period of two years and 40 hours of community service. Memories, eh? Well, I've got a lot to ask yeah. you. Before I do, let's go to AP. I'm right. sure he's got many questions for you. This is what we always do here at JohnTheBond.com. The existing members like to ask the new members a question. So AP, coming to us from IC Barcode Singapore, your question for King Raz of Estonia. Yeah, that's a, quite a synchronistic story. Uh, and I'll explain briefly why myself and TNG were just having a bit of a uh, back and forth with some messages the other day and uh, got into some something about channeling so there was a guy i had sent them some information on about channeling uh, and we were just having a bit of a chinwag so he then said to me uh, he'd done a piece for the site called spirits so go on and check that out so i only read that last night um, and now we're having this conversation today so there you go uh, so if you get a chance to uh, view the spirits article that TNG done, King Raz, you'll, you'll know why I'm saying it's synchronistic. Um, so my question to you would be, prior to this incident happening, did you notice any type of negative thinking or negative patterns that were creeping into your mind or was there any type of negative behavior that had started? Um, or maybe did you make an acquaintance with any type of people that you would have deemed negative? Would there be anything leading up to that experience that when you look back on now, you'd say, mm, yeah, maybe, maybe that might have con- contributed to this whole experience taking place? Yeah, there are definitely a couple of things that come into my mind. So um, prior to that, I've been living in the bush and basically smoking weed every day for four months so that definitely does a little bit of something to you and uh more often than not i've had more bad experiences with acid than with any anything else than good ones and um i was definitely as i said like in a negative mind state for for a couple of years due to the conspiracy you know realm pushing out fear porn pretty much and being addicted to that shit so I was in a deep victim mentality, and uh, yeah, it had all had like built up this reality in my head that was not even according to the real world, and it was just plain negative, uh, I guess. Those are some of the factors, but there's definitely more that could have gone into it. And um, do you think that maybe uh, these were? sort of underlying thoughts and beliefs that you would have had uh, and perhaps the if you want to say the defense mechanisms or the ability you had to keep them suppressed in your in your mind uh, might have broken down when you were on the acid and you had all these negative beliefs all sort of rush forward at this one period of time and the, the reason i'm asking is if you say it's out of character uh and this instance was a one-off, I, I would just be curious to know what would have happened or what would have taken part in your life leading up to that. Because um, I definitely don't think these things just happen by chance, you know? Yeah, definitely they don't. And uh, yeah, as I said, there were, there was multiple things that led up to that point. And there was definitely a lot of drugs and stuff involved. And it sort of messed with my brain's chemistry. And uh, the acid definitely opened up my defense mechanisms to being attacked by these thoughts that have sort of been there as suspicions but in that very instant they all like came to life and just i i sort of gave my power away to them if you know what i mean like i I couldn't hold on to my own frame anymore and i just lost it does that answer your question at all it it does yeah and so i i have a suspicion 
um, or a bit of an insight as to when you take substances. Um, mm. And I would sort of say specifically things like uh, alcohol is a big one. And then some of the drugs, not so much weed or LSD, but more things like ecstasy and cocaine. I, th- I think they can make you somewhat more susceptible to these negative experiences or if you want to say negative mental realities and and i think if you're doing you know drugs for a prolonged period of time or drinking for prolonged periods of time and then uh, absorbing your mind in conspiracy theories and obviously in them you have the whole reptilian uh, agenda is is intertwined with all that stuff it's probably not that unusual to hear that you've had the experience that you've had even as wild as it was but it's it's still not shocking to hear it if that makes sense yeah definitely and as i said we had been partying for three days and i do remember having mdma at some point and cocaine and alcohol so it was all just a big mishmash of chemicals i had no idea of what they could do to my psyche and yeah i guess i learned that night on my own skin how fragile the mind can be mm, mm. i i would feel that if you want to i'll use the word uh, evil negative or demonic type forces i think they exist i feel they exist but then by the same token i also feel that positive angelic or um uh, godlike if you know god's the wrong word that's a loaded word but angelic or positive type influences also exist um, and I think you can gravitate towards them type of energies or influences depending on the type of behaviors that you fill your day with. So um, yep. yeah, after, after all that happened and you had that experience, is there anything that you've done uh, or any type of habit or ritual that you would have brought into your life to maybe sway it towards the more positive, optimistic side of things that you, you seem to feel that you're in now? Oh, most definitely, man. Uh, prayer has actually become a daily part of my life. And, uh, you know, it's strange. I always, uh, Estonia is one of the least religious countries in the world. And I was never religious. I, di- I wasn't brought up religious. And I didn't th- think much of it. I was sort of atheistic, I would say. But uh, the thing that happened was sort of straight out of Bible, man. <laughs> like uh, a few days before my final court date, I was actually, I was, I tried everything, you know, I did all the things I need needed to be done. I got a suit, I got a nice lawyer, I got a barrister, I got a psychologist report. I I like did all the things and I was like, you know, I just started talking to myself. I pretty much closed my hands and I was like, God, like I've learned my lesson and I really just, you know, tried my best to, uh, make this thing right and to realize what i've done wrong and i and i said said my little prayer and then uh the day of the court was like most amazing because um uh i have a thing with number 24 i was born on the the september 24 and uh it is it's always been my favorite number and it has been there to like sort of show me that i'm on the right path I cannot even explain it, you know, it's so esoteric and personal. But anyway, on the day of the court, uh, at first I went up to the eighth floor, I think it was number 40 something, the courtroom. And they said that my, you know, case has been moved to another courtroom and it was floor six, number 24. And that that moment I realized like, bam, I'm saved. I, I just knew I'm good. I'm good to go. I can go home. And in a few days it did. And then later on, I, I actually looked into the Bible for the first time, and I went to, I think it was Meth. No, I don't remember what the name was, but the, six, the Revelation six twenty four was that you cannot serve two masters at once, and it was something something in the lines of you you cannot serve money and God at the same time. And before that, before even that revelation, like I thought to myself, like, can I serve two masters? You know. Is it possible to serve two masters at once? Because I had heard that sentence from somewhere that you can't, and I wanted to find out. So I was like, can I serve Satan and God, you know, metaphorically speaking, at the same time? And then one of my friends revealed to me that this, you know, the the Bible sink, 
And I was just amazed. I was blown away. And ever since then, like talking to God or the universe or the cosmos has been a daily part of my life. And I, I feel like it keeps me on the right path and yeah, keeps my <laughs> mental health and my spiritual health, so to speak, in check. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. I, I, I feel that there's definitely um, uh, true numbers because they're somewhat neutral. Uh, when we get these signs from these numbers, uh, they it's like they open up something in their mind and knowing that everything is going to be okay. So like you said, it was down to level six and then you see court number 24. Just seeing them two numbers on a door, it, it sets off this knowing inside yourself that, yeah, ev- everything is going to be okay. It's like messages through numbers that get relayed to yep. us by, by life. Totally. And the number 24 has always been my number to show me that everything is all right just continue down this path you're on the right track and i i'm not even looking for it like i was never looking for it but i just happened to see it everywhere (laughs) and it's crazy uh by now it's like normal but i'm still amazed every time i see it brilliant brilliant and what about your um your daily in intake of like um so you so you mentioned a few a few persian rugs a few drugs there that you used to take What's your relationship with them now? Uh, I'm completely off drugs. Uh, I I wouldn't say I'm against drugs, but I do think they hold merit to some certain situations for some people. But, you know, as far as it goes with me and the drugs, like I'm done for a long time for the foreseeable future. But I, I still have coffee and I guess tobacco, not daily, but pretty often. A little bit of alcohol too. You know, these are the type of dr- drugs you can sort of control. You don't lose your control of reality over. But um, uh, yeah, I haven't really done a lot of drugs since. I actually tried weed once and I was like, damn, this was a horrible idea. Why would I want to smoke something that makes me <laughs> retarded? Like, why would I just want to make myself stupid? I don't get it. It just makes me feel good, but also makes me retarded at the same time. That's not a price I'm willing to pay. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah, cool, cool. I, I, I definitely, yeah, uh, I feel you on that one. Like, I think you can classify drugs, and I don't really think um, coffee or or cigarettes or even alcohol in moderation uh, comes anywhere yeah. near close to banging lines of cocaine up your nose um, for three days straight. There, it's there. There are worlds and worlds apart. Yeah, definitely. Do you have experience with that? <laughs> Once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like that. <laughs> not not in a long time. Uh, not in a long time, but uh, yeah, where we grew up, um, we would have been rare on the stuff. <laughs> Mother's milk. <laughs> yeah, cocaine is yeah, crazy. But... It, it, I've, I, I've tried it too a couple of times, and it, uh, what I've noticed, it, it messes my mental state up for like, even if I did one line, it me- messes up my mental state for like almost a whole week. Like I have to recover for a week. It doesn't just, you know, it's not that, you know, that the next day I feel shitty or something. It's just that my whole discipline gets thrown out the window and I sort of get really too loose. Like well, I have to put my shit back together again. It's just not worth it for me. Mm, nope. Absolutely. Yeah. So just to uh, move it from drugs back to the Bible. So the Bible passage <laughs> is Matthew 6.24. Matthew 6.24, the King James Version says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon, is the, uh, the 6.24 reference that I think you were talking about earlier there, King Raz. That's it. Yeah. So, so it's just to put an underline under that story. So you went into the courtroom, everything worked out well. You did your community service. Forty hours is basically nothing. What, what did you have to do? Just like clean up garbage or teach um, foreigners uh, how to speak English? What was your, what was your service? Uh, the funny thing is, I actually skipped that part. Like I went and, you know, tried to get those affairs in order. But the thing w- w- was that I had, in the time that the final court date happened. I had to, I I was overstayed on my visa for already like two days. And I went to the immigration with my bags packed because obviously I could have just been thrown out of the country. And they said like, they asked me if I want to stay in, you know, if I want to come back anytime soon. I was like, I don't care. I just want to go home. 
and they just told me to leave, gave me it all all clear, and uh, I got out of the country in a matter of a few hours, and I left that community service undone. So don't expect me back anytime soon. Wow, how about that? So uh, so yeah, so you did all of that. That was a few years ago, and uh, now you're back in your home country, Estonia. No, no, that was actually just last year. So I got back into Estonia in November last year. Oh, so this is all a relatively recent thing. Okay. Yeah. yeah wow. Fully. Fascinating. All right. So so you've seem to have gotten things back on track. You're doing well. You're in Estonia, back in your home country, and then something yep. draws you back to johnthebond.com. Is it the coronavirus? Is this what has sort of made you want to revisit the site? No, I actually stayed in touch. You know, I was subs- subscribed to your channel. So, uh, yeah, when the coronavirus hit, you started putting out more videos. And I, I knew instantly that this, this thing looks like a joke. Like, I need to find out what's going on. And you started putting out good content. So I started getting into it. And, you know, you have these videos where you show stuff or you you give, I mean, your mailing list on your mailing list to give away like uh, member content for free for, to people. And I was just intrigued. I wanted to find out more. And I actually told you when I left that I'm going to come back as a full member. So it just had to happen sooner or later because uh, I'm very intrigued about these topics. And, you know, uh, I have a inquiring mind, so I got to feed it, I guess. <laughs> I'm so glad you said that. I'm very proud of that mailing list. You know, I got the impetus to put more effort into that mailing list from the time I spent in Chiang Mai. Because the idea of Chiang Mai is all these people trying to you know, run online businesses. And I was listening to people speak at presentations and whatever. And just hearing some people speak, I was like, you know what? I've got a mailing list. Why don't I promote it more? Why don't I use it more? And ever since then, it seems to have worked well. And it's nice when you go somewhere to learn, you learn a lesson, you try and put it into practice, you, get, you seem to get results from it. It's, like, it's nice sometimes when it works out. So I'm glad to hear you say that. Now, we're coming towards the end of the first hour. And I want to get through a couple more questions for you before we do wrap up the first hour, because in the second hour, we're coming back to talk about the topics that you suggested, which let's throw mm-hmm. this out there for the listeners. What were the topics that you wanted to come back and talk about in the second hour very quickly? Well, our first topic, dreams versus reality. Uh, how do we discern something is whether something is real or not? The sec- second topic is uh, death, death and afterlife. And the third the topic is uh, the gender agenda, which I'm not too pro- prolific on, but I definitely see it everywhere around me, you know? Yeah, that'll make for a good second hour, no doubt about it. So a couple of questions just from your introduction that I wanted to run past you. You mentioned the 5G antennas and the chemtrails. What are your thoughts on those topics now? I wasn't big, big on chemtrails for a while, but now I'm like, even if it is true, I will just say to myself that this is not real and it cannot affect me in any way because if you think about it like planes dropping chemicals over your head all the time is it just fucks you up like even breathing fresh air you cannot even enjoy breathing anymore you think you're constantly being attacked so i have no way of proving they're real so therefore i will rather you know say that they're a hoax but the 5g thing well this has been an interesting topic for years too because um ever since i started looking into it i've been starting to see more antennas pop up everywhere but i also think it's because you know we have the thing called ras which is the reticular activation system so whatever we focus on we start to see more around us so i kind of dropped that too you know i just i can't live with the thought of being attacked all the time it's just too fucking crazy so the reason why that stood out to me when you were explaining the the path that you went through was because in 2016 I did acid a few times, not many times, but a few times, because I met a guy at a job that I was working in. It's a very long story, but there was one day in particular that I'll never forget. It was like the day after a night on the acid, or what we were told was acid. You don't even know what you're doing half the time. Like if someone tells you it's something, it has certain effects, you just believe it is what people say. How do you know? But the day after one of those things, I was walking around my suburb, and it was the first time I'd looked at all of the phone, like the cell phone towers as as weapons or as um, dangerous and i'll never forget that feeling of, of like believing in that moment that actually yeah maybe these things are harming us like every second of every day so like instead of not even noticing the, the cell phone towers or instead of thinking oh it's just technology actually seeing these things all around my suburb 
as uh, weapons. It was like a, a walk around the suburb I'll never forget. And I don't think it's a coincidence that I was having those thoughts the day after uh, what had happened the, the night before. And I'm not saying that's necessarily a, a good correlation or a negative one. I'm just saying it's, I don't think it's a coincidence to me. And that's why a lot of what you were saying stood out to me. But, you know, with this coronavirus thing, a lot of people are talking about 5G again. And a lot of people do believe that 5G is, is dangerous and why are they installing this stuff everywhere and what is this technology? Are you open-minded to the possibility that it actually is putting aside all of the conspiratardism that 5G actually might be dangerous? Like, are you still open to that? I'm definitely open-minded to that because, um, you know, we're electrical beings and we don't know what these electrical signals are doing to us. So I actually have an experience too with with the 4g uh but uh i was staying at my brother's house and i had a router in the very same room as i slept and at night i just couldn't go to sleep like my head felt like it was going to explode and just i started hearing more like the tinnitus in my ear went louder and louder and I, and at one point i figured out it must be the router like what else could it be and i turned out and had a good night's sleep so i don't know i think there's something to it but uh I'm open to also it being safe and, you know, not that dangerous to us because 5G with the 5G is, is being more directed from antenna to antenna, not as, um, you know, just splashing around all over the place like 4G. But See, I wonder about that. How is that possible? Like if, uh, if a device is transmitting this energy that we call 5G radiation or 5G frequency or whatever, how can it be a beam? Like how is it not just a... You know what I'm trying to say? Like I'm not really articulating myself. But yeah, yeah, but we do have laser beams. I mean, <laughs> they're directed energy. It is light. It's a different thing, but it's still, I don't know. Like blanket energy. coverage, can... is that what you're saying? Well, I mean, like as in, um, suppose you've got a big cell tower, just let's call it a cell tower, and it's communicating with all these different mobile phones in its little um, hexagon, because they, they're in a hexagon network, I think, like Honeycomb. All the little phones in its hexagon, how is it sending its its information to them directly, like line of sight or whatever. How, how could it do that? How could it do that and not be just sending out information uh, broad? Like I'm open-minded to it, but it just doesn't make sense to me on, a, on an intuitive level. Do you see what I'm trying to say? Like, okay, yeah, so okay. let me explain it to you like this. Suppose you've got like a 5G tower, any kind of cell tower, and for whatever reason, all of the phones in its hexagon are on the western side of it. There's no phones on the eastern side. Am I supposed to believe that if I'm standing on the eastern side that there's no radiation from that tower coming to me i don't think so man I, that doesn't make sense to me doesn't make sense to me yeah that does not make any sense at all uh, what do you think about the whole thing well that's that's kind of what i'm trying to get at here like I, I don't i'm not scared of cell phone towers but at the same time i am very much open-minded to the idea that they're quite seriously harmful on an individual or a, a larger level i'm still open to that i'm not promoting that idea but I'm definitely mm. open to it. But what I was saying a moment ago was I, I spent a, a solid day, uh, like in, a day in particular, and then there was like residual effect where I was convinced these things were, were dangerous because I'd never looked at them that way before. I'd never bought into the cell tower danger before this particular day in 2016. And that was the first day where I was like, holy shit, this is, uh, this is serious. And for context, for people who are listening to this, um, you know, out of order or sometime in the future, I released a piece called The Corona Grid maybe a month ago. So I'll put a link to that below this call and a lot of what I'm saying will make more sense. Now, we do need to wrap up the first hour. Before we do, I've got two more questions for you. You mentioned 24 is very significant to you. Have you read the sync books? I have not. And I've heard you mention the number 24 and 42, something to do with death. And um, that's about as far as that goes. Well, well, not so much death, but 42 does come up a lot. And, uh, you know, without going into too much detail about it, the Sync Book does look at 42 specifically. And the SyncBook.com, one of their two podcast staples is called, well, one of them is called Always Record, which is where I stole the name and called it Sometimes Record. And then the other one is called 42 Minutes, which they try and keep to 42 minutes. But they got the idea for 42 minutes from all the 42s that turn up in movie after movie after movie. And of course, in Waking Life, and I just released the podcast for that a few days ago that we recorded, Hilly and I, back in December. In Waking Life, the guy in the boat, the guy who takes the kid on his first journey from the airport, there's all these 242424 on the boat, which you could read as like a 42 symbol or as a 24. And a lot of the 42s and 24s are sort of interchangeable. So the fact that 24 is so significant to you 
just from a basic entry level sync perspective is uh to me that's no coincidence do you know what i mean which is why yeah, when you yeah, said that 24 was like you wanted to do because we did call 23 with mr natural and 23 is his special number i played footy with the guy he used to wear number 23 and i used to wear number 17 so he's on call number 23 by so-called coincidence and then you said you wanted to be on 24 because it was your special number. Now they've explained your story. I'm like, yeah, I'm glad that we set aside 24 for King Rats. It's, it makes perfect sense. But the fact that you haven't read the sync books blows me away. To yourself and to everybody else out there, man, the first sync book will cost you like 20 bucks. Most people who read it come back to me and they say they're glad they read it. In fact, I don't think I've had a single person say to me that was a waste of their time. And I'm not getting any kickbacks from this guy. I don't get a cent from the sync book. In fact, the guy who runs the syncbook.com, I don't think he likes me. I don't think he likes me. He, he never replied. He's never replied to any of my communication. I think most of the sync book people, uh, how do I put this to you? I think most of them don't know about me. And those who know about me don't like me because I talk about a whole bunch of controversial topics beyond sync. So I'm definitely not here to make money promoting the sync books, but I'm saying to people, if you have any interest in anything that myself or Azure AP have said today in this first hour, the sync book, just buy the first one. Give it a read and, and you'll either love it or hate it. And uh, I think you'll probably love it. So final question. This is always the most interesting one. You've come to johnthebond.com. You've got a good idea of what goes on here. There must be some topics that you disagree with us about. Uh, the floor is yours. Tell us. There's some topics here that we talk about where you're like, yeah, I, I don't think so. I think these people are probably, they've gone a bit too far. Mm, to be honest, like I, I'm having, I'm struggling to find one because uh I thought about it before because I've listened to a couple of your podcasts while working out on the field and I just couldn't come up with anything really. But the only thing that stood out to me was uh, on the third, on the post, uh, 37 things normies believe, uh, number 32, the, that miscegenation, or I don't even know how you say that, pronounce that, but um, uh, two people making a baby from different races basically ends up in uh, negative health consequences for the kid. Or, and that was the general gist of it. And I don't really get it. Um, I don't know how. Mm, okay, so what I'll do is I'll put a link in the info box of this call as well to a podcast I did back in 2016, same year, called Muhammad Ali Speaks Beautiful Truth or something like this. And to cut a very long story short, I was I grew up believing that mixed race children have better health outcomes than single race children because of um, genetic diversity or there's some term that they give you about, oh, it's good to mix the genes because it makes them more immune to diseases and stuff. Like, like I just believed that. I just believed, like, why wouldn't I? That's what I was raised to believe. And, you know, when I was younger, I had a non-white girlfriend and all that kind of thing. Like, I'd never thought twice about it. And then I discovered some stuff in, uh, yeah, 2015, 2016 that just blew my mind. So I couldn't help but make that podcast in 2016. And yeah, the evidence is all there. Now, is my position that people should not have mixed race children? No, that's not my position at all. No matter who is having the children, there are environmental factors that have a much larger bearing on the outcome for the baby than the genetics of their parents. So who cares what race the baby is if the parents won't read to the baby, okay? It doesn't matter if you've got two white people, two Asian people, two African people. If they won't read books to the child, then it's a pointless endeavor. Or if they put the child in front of a TV for two hours a day, pointless endeavor. You know what I'm trying to say? So the, the genetics are, are secondary at best to the environmental factors. However, if anyone out there was raised to believe, as I was, that mixed race children have better health outcomes, the evidence, the overwhelming evidence, uh, says something quite different, which is why I put that on the uh, 37 things normies believe. But I know it's a very controversial thing, very touchy, and I completely understand it so we have to wrap up the first hour of the call normally we'd go to the credits but we're already way over time on the first hour so we'll leave out the credits for now we'll come back and do those in the second hour will you join us for the second hour ap from singapore you still good i'm good yep and we've got with us king raz our special guest from estonia you still good for the second hour there ready to go sensational so as king raz mentioned before the topics will be dreaming reality death in the afterlife and if we get time another touchy subject gender agenda We'll be back for that here at johnthebond.com in just a moment. Big thanks to everybody making this possible. Everybody who's normally in the credits, I'll read you guys out in the second hour. You all know who you are. Thank you very much for making this possible. This is Sometimes Record, episode number 24. Special guest, King Raz Estonia, AP, coming to us from Singapore. I'm John the Bond, coming to you from beautiful Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. How much longer have I got left here? Well, nobody knows. Uh, nobody knows what the hell's going on. It's uh, a post-311 world. We'll see you in just a moment for hour two, which you can get at johnthebond.com. And until next time, no more monkey business.